Chapter 80 There is only one truth you are listening at NovelFull.audio. Dresder, Northern Gate. 15.33 Daniel and the rest of his group had just managed to come back from their journey up north, and were now waiting to get into the immense city of Dresder. At the gate, the usual fifth-rank guards stood in wait. I've just finished counting. Said Lagarde after suddenly appearing right next to Daniel, and scaring the people in line around them out of their wits. Daniel had felt someone crossing the one-way portal within his pocket dimension, so he wasn't scared in the slightest. He turned to look at Lagarde, and after putting his hands on his shoulders, he said, Great, I knew you would be perfect for this job. What is your estimate? I would slap the back of your head. If you weren't stronger than I am. Responded Lagarde through a sideways look. He then calmed down, and continued, about 40,000 weapons of decent quality, 7,000 weapons of good quality, and 2,000 high-quality weapons. What's your value estimation? Asked Daniel immediately after hearing Lagarde's response. Alice and Heimart turned to look at him with a strange expression. Lagarde said, really? It's not that hard of a calculation. The price for weapons of decent quality usually goes from 250 gold coins to 750, good quality weapons go from 750 to 2000, and high quality weapons go from 2000 to 5000. We could sell them in batch for 19 millions at the very least. Daniel noticed the weird looks of Alice and Heimart, and after a soft sigh, he said, I've never went to school. I know nothing about weapons or their worth, except for the cheap ones you can find in the streets. Lagarde immediately felt bad about his previous comment, but he didn't show it on the outside. Instead, he pretended like it didn't matter, and started to explain the weapons classification and value. You probably wouldn't have known this even if you did go to school. Weapons are divided into five categories, which are used to indicate the overall quality of work, materials used, and durability of the weapon. These categories are lower, decent, good, high, and perfect. After a few minutes of explanation, Daniel had caught up with the general knowledge of weapons value and classification. He stood in place with a pensive look for a few moments, then turned to look at Lagarde and said, we should keep the high-quality weapons in case other people will join. It seems unlikely that we would be able to provide everyone with a perfect quality weapon. So we should build a weaponry and store there the high-quality ones. He then turned to look at Alice and said, can you take care of that? No problem. Responded Alice promptly. Once again, Daniel turned to look at Lagarde and said, the rest of the weapons should sell for at least 15 millions, but that's a low estimation from what you've told me. We will sell the weapons in batch. But not to a merchant. We'll sell them to an auction. That's not a good idea. The bids usually start low. There is a good chance that the weapons will go for under their value due to the fact that not many bidders will have armies to whom they need to provide equipment to. I was thinking about selling them to the military instead. Responded Lagarde. Daniel smiled at him and said, Don't worry, I have my methods. Legion's Recruitment Office. 17.05 I'm here to report the completion of a mission and complete my registration to the Legion. Said Daniel to the clerk behind the desk. The man took a sheet of paper from under his desk and said with an indifferent voice, Here, fill this in. On the form a few informations were required. Amongst them was the type of mission, whether the mission was a group mission or an individual one, name of the group, number of participants, objective of the mission, and a full report of what had happened. It took him ten full minutes to finish. Luckily the line for this particular counter was basically non-existent, and aside from his group members, Daniel was the only one there at the moment. Heimart was the only one of the five that had taken 30 minutes to finish, due to the fact that, being the leader of the group, the aimless adventurer, aside from filling the same form for the completion of the mission that the others had to fill in, he also had to fill a form to report the behavior of the group during the mission. They were all aware that other groups which belonged to the Legion had probably already reported on their behavior, so Heimart didn't dare to let any detail out. Included their clash with the groups from the other parties, and their motivations. 
Daniel solved Jiraiya's problem with writing a report by simply creating a thin layer of stone with which he covered his palm, and controlled it into writing the report in human language. Once the man clerk noticed Daniel's and Jiraiya's names, he sprung up from his chair and rushed into a door placed on the wall behind the counters. Wow! That guy is really eager to give us our medallions, said Lagarde sarcastically. Unfortunately, ten more minutes passed uneventfully. Daniel and the rest had decided to find a place to sit and wait, but right at that moment, the door opened once again, and from it the clerk entered once again in the lobby while following a well-dressed and much older man. This old man had a polite smile on his face, and his white head full of hair made him look like a rich and friendly grandpa. Of course, Daniel and the rest were not aware that, this old man, was in fact responsible of this recruitment office, and was a veteran martial cultivator at the mid-eighth rank. The two men approached the counter, and stopped right in front of Daniel's group. The old man said, you must be, the aimless adventurer. I've heard many things about you in the last 40.8 hours. Follow me. He then turned around and started walking towards the door once again. Daniel and the rest followed him in, and after entering the door, they ended up into a long corridor with various closed rooms to the opposite side of the lobby. In this corridor, a few people walked back and forth at a fast pace, while carrying forms and documents from one room to another. The two men lead Daniel and the rest into the only double door within the corridor. Behind this double door was an impressive looking office. This office was not simple by any means. The refined couches, tables and chairs were separated from the dark hardwood floor by carpets made out of white high dot ranking beast furs. On one of these refined couches, a man clad in red armor sat quietly while reading a few documents. The old man, ignoring the existence of the man in red armor, directly walked behind his desk and sat on his chair. While at the same time, the clerk placed five chairs in front of the desk, and after excusing himself in a polite manner, he left the room. Before the clerk left, he looked at the man clad in red armor with eyes filled with admiration. Please sit. Said the old man in a polite manner. Daniel and the rest immediately took a seat, and waited to hear what the old man had to say. First of all, I wanted to clarify what truly happened in the forest of towering rocks. You might not know this, but in the couple of days prior to your return, many groups reported various versions of what happened to their powers. Including other groups that belonged to the Legion. Said the old man while looking at Heimart and Alice, which he had believed to be the leaders of the group. This misconception of the group's mechanics had been caused by the belief that, it was in fact thanks to Heimart's charisma that he had managed to rope two absolute geniuses like Daniel and Jirai into his newly formed group. The reason why Alice was believed to be one of the leaders, was because during the registration of the group, Heimart had indicated her as second in command. Some groups reported that all powers discovered the truth of what happened at the same time, and that thanks to a quick thinking on your part, your group was able to ally with a couple of powerful earth elementals. A second group reported that you were split into two teams, and that one of these teams was in fact responsible of completing the mission first. But after the other groups arrived at the scene, you have attacked them in order to prevent them to report the mission before you. A third group even claimed that an all-out war broke out, and that the prize was a high-level earth treasure of which you might be in possession of. Said the old man in a confused tone. Heimart straightened his back in his chair, and after clearing his throat, he said, There is part of the truth in all of these stories, sir. But the entire truth is completely different. By all means, tell me what really happened then. Said the old man with a calm tone. Once again, Heimart cleared his throat and said, We have reached the rocky forest four days after receiving the mission. The moment we've reached the place, we have indeed split into two groups. Dan and Alice went to look for informations inside the rocky forest, while me, my cousin Lagarde, and Jirai went to look for allies from other powers. At this moment, Alice started to talk. We have talked to a good number of traveling merchants, and from them, we've learned that the only victims were solitary martial cultivators that were hired right outside of the closest cities in the area. Not one merchant, 
guard or traveler had ever disappeared in the same fashion. What lead you to the encounter with the earth elementals? Asked the old man with clear interest. We have heard the sounds of a battle, and after reaching the site, we found a dead body and an earth elemental present on scene. This earth elemental was more powerful than we were, so we've tried to earn some time by talking to him. He revealed that the men he killed were bandits, and that they were part of a band that lead merchants into the rocky forest just to rob them and kill them. She said with a calm and polite tone. Dot, and you've believed it. Asked the old man through a dubious expression. Not at first. But then he led us to a mass grave in which hundreds of bodies had been disposed. The bodies presented injuries made by human weapons. She responded with a hint of anger in her voice. Heimart picked up once again and started to recount the rest of his side of the story. After five full minutes, the office was quiet once again. The old man's eyes moved towards the man clad in red armor every time the story recounted by Heimart and Alice reached an apex. But after noticing the lack of interest of the man, he would go back into listening to the two. That's an impressive feat, can you explain the nicknames I've seen in the reports? The Mute Sword Demon and the Stormbringer. Said the old man in curiosity. That should be the two of us. Said Daniel in a polite tone. Finally, for the first time, the man clad in red armor put the documents down and focused on listening. The old man smiled at Daniel and said, How were you two capable of fighting and defeating sixth rank cultivators? Dedication to cultivation. And a bit of alchemical support, sir. Responded Daniel while pretending a bit of shyness. Chapter 81 The Warehouse You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Dedication to cultivation. And a bit of alchemical support, sir. Responded Daniel while pretending a bit of shyness. The old man smiled faintly and said, Well, I've seen the results of your tests. So I don't doubt your dedication to cultivation. Your discipline is remarkable for your age. I wonder who your instructors are. He asked while looking at Jirai. He doesn't talk much. Said Daniel promptly. I understand. You too are very resourceful. Keep up your effort and you'll go far in the world of cultivation. Said the old man with a satisfied tone. He then looked at the man clad in red armor, and after receiving a faint nod from him, he turned back to look at Heimart and said, Very well, the aimless adventurer is allowed to operate under the name of the Legion. He then personally handed five medallions over to Heimart and said, These are your medallions. You may go. Daniel and the rest stood up, bowed politely to the old man, and left the room. Once out of the room, the old man immediately stood up, and approached the man in red armor. Commander, do you want us to keep an eye on them? He asked in an extremely polite tone. Yes. And report to me if anything happens. Responded the man in red armor with an authoritative tone. He then got up as well, and left. Do you think they believed us? Heimart asked to Daniel. Daniel responded without looking back at him. I believe he doesn't care what happened. He was only scouting us for the man in red armor. How do you know? This time was Alice to ask a question. Finally out of the building and back in Dresster streets, Daniel said, You've all noticed how the old man kept looking at him every now and then. But I've also felt how the wind around the man's face changed when he nodded at the old man. He was clearly a superior and the one who actually wanted to see us. What do you think the reason is? Asked Heimart in a low and serious tone. Daniel shrugged with his shoulders and said, They either want the essence treasure, or they could be trying to rope us in. Seeing how the old man mentioned the nicknames that others gave us. I think the latter is more plausible. What do you guys want to do now? Should we find an auction house right away, or should we wait and let the dust settle? Asked Ligart. He seemed to be in a good mood, and couldn't wait to get rid of the source of his last few days of suffering. We have nothing better to do. Let's ask around and see if we can find a place to go to today. Said Daniel with an excited tone. 
Daniel and the rest asked around for half an hour, and in the end, they had narrowed the choice to three high.end auction houses that hosted events that very night. The first one was an auction house that dealt in cultivation items. It was called a cultivator's oasis, and it was the right place to go to in order to stock up on beast cores. The second auction house was called Clear Sky Auction House and it mostly dealt in alchemical items. Pills, plants, instruments and various other items were easy to find in the Clear Sky Auction House. The third and last auction house worked very differently from other regular auction houses. The auction house was called The Warehouse, and it dealt in wholesale deals. The type of auction used by the warehouse was called silent auction and it was a much more genial type of event than a regular auction, as it would usually be hosted during a social event. Each seller would describe the type of item, and the amount they possessed to a clerk at the beginning of the night, which would then make a list of all the items put for auction, and distribute these lists to each attendees along with their number. The attendees would then write their bids on the side of each desired item, and hand over the list to the clerk. At the end of the night, the highest bidder would be announced. Intrigued by how a silent auction worked, Daniel and the rest decided to go to the warehouse. The auction started at 21.00 sharp, and ended at midnight. The warehouse location was on the other side of the city, and Daniel and the rest still had to divide the items into even batches. After a minute of deliberation, the group agreed that Daniel would be in charge of their transportation to the auction house, and that on the way, he would call Alice out once he found a clothing merchant, so that she could help him with choosing appropriate clothing for them to wear during the silent auction event. At the same time, Heimart, Lagarde, Jirai and Alice would have to stay in the castle and divide the weapons into four separate batches. Each batch would be composed by 10,000 decent quality weapons, and 1,500 good quality weapons, which they would sell separately. The warehouse, 19.25 This was the first time that Daniel had wore formal clothes in his life. Daniel's clothes were composed of a dark grey suit with a white shirt underneath the jacket, and a pair of black lucid boots. Heimart and Lagarde wore the same type of suit Daniel wore, but of two different shades of blue instead. Their shoes were also similar, but of a brown color. Jiraiya's clothes were much more noticeable than Daniel's or the two cousins. For him, Alice had chosen a white suit with a white tie over a black shirt. His serious look and short blonde hair made him look like the imperturbable young master of a powerful group. At his waist, a brown leather belt held a sheathed ceremonial sword. They were currently waiting for Alice to change and come out of the pocket dimension. Daniel and the rest had arrived early in order to make sure that they would be able to add their items to the list. What was before them was a huge mansion. The place looked very similar to their castle, but it was slightly smaller and much more illuminated. The sun had started to set in the horizon, turning the sky into a tapestry filled with vibrant colors. The dusky hue shined over the stone walls, making the observers stare at it in awe. Daniel, Jirai, Heimart, and Lagarde walked above a cleanly cut rocky path, right in the middle of a well-kept yard. To the sides of this path, various bushes covered in multicolored flowers gave those who crossed the rocky path a pleasant feeling. The mansion's large double door was wide open, and at the entrance, a well-dressed servant waited patiently for guests to arrive. When Daniel and the others arrived, the servant bowed politely and said, Welcome dear guests. The auction will not start before another hour and a half. If you wish to wait inside, you are welcome to enter and enjoy the refreshment. We would like to add some items to the list, if that's possible. Said Heimart with a polite tone. Of course. Please, follow me. Responded the well-dressed servant before making a wavy gesture with his hand, and taking Daniel and the rest into the mansion. The servant took Daniel and the rest to a side room within the mansion. This room was a large lounge, and inside this lounge, various seemingly unoccupied evaluators interacted amongst each other. The servant turned to look at Heimart and asked, Dear guest, what kind of item would you like to put for auction? Weapons. A large number of them. Responded Heimart promptly. 
The servant smiled politely at Heimart, then turned towards the group of evaluators and said, Mr. Robinreck, these guests would like to put some weapons for auction. Your assistance is required. A large and muscular-looking man separated from the rest of the evaluators and approached Daniel's group. He then stopped right in front of them and said, Good evening, I am Mr. Robinreck. Please follow me in another room so that I can have a look at your items. Daniel and the rest followed him into a room that bordered the lounge. This room was extremely well lit, and aside from the entrance and a large robust table, there was nothing else within. Mr. Robinreck approached the large table and stood next to it, he then waited for Heimark to take the weapons out. Out of his expectation, Daniel walked out of the group and instead of approaching the table, he approached the large and empty wall. With a wave of his hand, hundreds of crates appeared, covering the wall completely. These crates contained 10,000 decent quality weapons, and 1,500 good quality weapons. Said Daniel with a plain and emotionless tone. Completely taken by surprise, Mr. Robinreck looked at the hundred of crates with a dumbfounded expression. It was only after a full minute that he regained his wits, and said, this is an impressive amount of weapons. Do you plan on selling them all together, or do you plan to split them into smaller batches? Daniel looked at Heimart and the rest in a slightly embarrassed way, then turned towards Mr. Robinreck and said, actually, this is only one of four identical batches. Once again, the poor evaluator fell silent due to the shock. His reaction was understandable. Usually, the only ones who put such a large amount of weapons for auctions would only be the representatives of the various blacksmith groups. In fact, had he not noticed the legion medallions that hung by the four's belts, he would have believed that these four elegant young men were a blacksmith group's representatives. Despite the experience of Mr. Robinreck, Due to the large amount of weapons, it still took him over an hour to finish checking over almost 50,000 weapons. He then looked at Heimart and said, Your weapons are acceptable, and will be added to the list of tonight's auctioned items. Please, go back to the lobby and enjoy the refreshment until the auction starts. Daniel and the rest nodded politely at the man, and momentarily left the mansion. They then found a bench in the yard to sit on, and observed the incoming guests while waiting for Alice. After only a few minutes of wait, Daniel felt someone going through the one-way portal within the pocket space. The very next moment, Alice appeared in front of them. She was unrecognizable. She was wearing a slim-fit cocktail dress of a bright red color. Her shoulders were exposed, and the top of her dress had a V-dot neckline. The dress was sleeveless, and kept in place by two shoestring straps that crossed behind her back. The lower part of her dress was a wrap skirt that draped just past her knees, leaving her lower legs exposed. On her feet, she wore a pair of golden ankle strap heels that gave her a few additional centimeters of height. Her hair were kept in a neat face dot framing pieces style, and on her ears, she wore two expensive white gold earrings with blue topaz gems. On her face, she had applied an appropriate and light amount of makeup. The four looked at her with eyes opened in shock. The first to regain his wits was Lagarde, which has always tried to make a joke out of embarrassing situation. But before he could talk, Alice looked at him sideways and said, Before you say anything, remember that I am one thought away from stabbing your leg. Lagarde was petrified on the spot. You look good, said Daniel with a smile. Alice smiled back showing her white teeth, and responded, Thank you, it was at this moment that Heimart stood up and said, Well, it's about time. Shall we? Chapter 82 Silent Auction You are listening at NovelFull.audio The Warehouse, 20.52 Less than 10 minutes were left before the silent auction would begin. Daniel and the rest stood by the side of the hall while observing the crowd become larger and larger. Leaders of prominent families, heads of sects, masters of schools of martial arts, and even members of the military were present. Daniel was able to understand their power thanks to the clerk, which announced the arrival of each of these prominent figures the very moment they entered the hall. He and Jirai were standing quietly on their own, while Lagarde went to socialize with the young masters of other powerful groups. 
He and Heimart were the pride of their school of martial arts, but even they weren't used to such a high-level event. Heimart, on the other hand, was currently walking around with Alice. The two walked arm in arm, and the reason for this, was to stop the young masters from constantly pestering Alice. Alice was much more comfortable than the rest of them. Her group had been founded by an extremely prominent figure of the area, and even if the population had forgotten about the horrid acts the clear mage committed, they did not forget his battle prowess and talent. Within the group of rich cultivators, Daniel had noticed a few interesting scenes. Scenes like a quarrel between two men who belonged to different, and probably enemy groups. After the quarrel had ended, the wife of the first man looked at the second man with a sweet and complicit smile. Roaming around the hall, was an extremely good-looking young man dressed in a green martial attire. On his shoulder, was his school's coat dot of dot arms, which showed a dragon flying upwards in the sky, while surrounded by clouds. This young man kept following a family of three with his eyes. This family was composed of a stunning-looking middle-aged woman with platinum blonde hair, a man with slightly long but well-kept hair, and a teenage girl which seemed to be the younger version of her mother. This young man couldn't stop looking at the teenage girl, but whenever her mother looked back at him, he would immediately turn away and pretend that he wasn't doing anything. Another interesting thing that Daniel had noticed, was that despite the large and expensive-looking buffet, the only thing that people consumed was a cup of tea which they personally requested the attendants that patiently waited by the sides of the room, to prepare. Daniel and Jirai weren't aware of the common etiquette, so they had approached the buffet more than once in the past ten minutes, provoking disdainful looks by the high dot class people that noticed them. Esteemed guests. Welcome to the warehouse. I am Mr. Crean, and I will be responsible for revealing the winners of the auctioned items. I hope that you will enjoy tonight's event. Said a middle-aged man that stood in the middle of the hall with an extremely polite tone. After making sure that everyone's attention was on him, he continued, for those who are new to this type of auction, I'll explain the rules once again. He said before pointing his hand towards a large table placed in the side of the room, if you'd be kind enough to look to my right, you would notice a large number of envelopes placed above that table. Each of these envelopes contains a list of the auctioned items, and an identity stone. The offers must be written next to the items present in the list before the end of the bidding stage of the event. At any point during the event, you may approach one of the attendants and ask for quill and ink. He then stopped for a moment, and with a reassuring tone he said, Do not worry about the possibility of your offers being read by others. Every single object is enchanted, and it is impossible to follow its true movement. A portion of key must be inserted into the identity stone, and put back into the envelope along with the list that contains your offers. He said in a clear and loud voice. In case of two or more identical offers, the bidders will have a chance to withdraw their offer, or proceed into a quick round of open ascending price auction. After the middle-aged man finished explaining the rules, he smiled and said, Ladies and gentlemen, the bidding stage of the action starts now. Have a wonderful evening. Daniel approached the table, and took one of the envelopes. He then put his spiritual essence inside of the identity stone, and started to browse through the list of auctioned items. The list could be hardly considered a simple list. In truth, it was closer to a book. On each page, a dozen of items would be described in detail. The description was very thorough, and even the current market price of the item was included in it. The items were ordered by category, and these categories were cultivation resources, alchemical ingredients, weapons, armors and many other. The main point of selling the weapons, was for Daniel and the rest to purchase cultivation resources. They had no plans of accepting other missions, and instead wanted to work on themselves, and on making the castle habitable. What caught Daniel's attention was the section of the list dedicated to cultivation resources. In it, various levels of beast cores were listed in order of rank. There were many deals, and each of them comprised a large batch of beast cores. The lower the rank of the beast cores, the higher would the amount be. At the bottom of the cultivation section, Daniel noticed three different batches which evoked his interest. 
The first offer, comprised 250 beast cores of the 5th level, and 50 cores of the 6th level. The market value of this batch was of 500,000 gold coins. The beast cores included in the second offer were of a broader selections, which spanned from 3rd rank to 7th rank beast cores. Its market price was of 900,000 gold coins. The third and last offer, included 200 beast cores of the 6th rank, and 10 of the 7th rank. The market value reached 3 million gold coins. Daniel had decided to place an offer on each of these offers, but instead of guessing the right price, he started to observe the many guests that possessed a negative karma. He then wished that these people would not be able to win the items, and in a matter of moments, a window appeared in his mind as if out of his own desires. Underscore 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 asterisk primary quest started. No rest for the wicked asterisk description. Complicate the lives of humans with bad karma. Third objective set. Outbid the highest bidders with bad karma. Optional. Purchase batch 1 for 691,001 gold coins. Optional. Purchase batch 3 for 3,886,001 gold coins. Reward. 5,000 KP, plus 1, plus 1, slash 20% negative reputation with plus 46 different powers, details. Slash 40% positive reputation with plus 21 different powers, details, underscore 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 underscore. I guess batch 2 will be purchased by someone with good karma. I'll have to make a honest bid. Muttered Daniel to himself in a low voice. Suddenly, the voice of a girl arrived from behind Daniel's back. It said, what are you muttering about? Daniel turned around, and saw a beautiful girl with platinum blonde hair look at him with an expression contorted in confusion. She seemed to be looking at a crazy person. He understood immediately that this girl was the direct kind of person, so instead of explaining himself and ease her confusion, Daniel decided to joke around. He looked at the girl and said, I was talking to you, who else could I be talking to? Stop being so weird. The girl's confusion deepened, and with a slightly irritated tone she said, how could that be true, we've never met. Daniel's expression changed into one of shock. He then said with a hurt tone, how can you say that? It's been so long since the first time you've talked to me. I still cherish in my heart the first words you've ever said to me. What are you muttering about, Dot? A beautiful smile suddenly appeared on the girl's face. With an apologetic tone she said, I am so sorry. Please forgive me, I had no recollection of a past so far away. The two started to laugh at each other's silly behavior. Suddenly, a teenage boy approached them from the side. It was the young man dressed in a green martial attire that Daniel had seen stare at the girl with obsession. He turned towards the platinum blonde girl, and asked with an angry tone, who is this? The girl's expression turned into one of annoyance, but before she could respond, Daniel said, you too. Did you forget about your best friend? What are you talking about? I have never seen you in my life. Responded the young man in an irritated manner. The girl was currently trying to hold her laughter. After noticing the girl's actions, the young man started to feel embarrassed. It didn't take long for his embarrassment to turn into rage, and just as he was about to lash out on Daniel, the girl stopped laughing. She then turned towards Daniel, bowed gracefully at him, and walked back to her parents. The young man looked at the direction the girl had turned towards, and after noticing the serious look of the girl's mother, he straightened his back and walked away as well. Once again, Daniel noticed the girl's family. And once his eyes landed on her father, he felt some sort of familiarity with him. Unfortunately, he couldn't wrap his head around it. 
Daniel had no idea when Jirai had separated from him, and after a quick search, he found him standing in the middle of a group of girls. These girls seemed to want to talk to him, but he looked back at them in silence. When Jirai noticed Daniel, an unusual pitiful expression appeared on his face. He wanted Daniel's help to get him out of trouble, but instead of approaching him, Daniel disappeared back into the crowd. Despite of what Jirai might have thought, Daniel did not only do this to mess around with him. The reason why he had left Jirai in that situation, was because he hoped to instill some desire to learn the human language into him. After a few minutes of strolling in the hall, Daniel noticed Heimart and Alice. He immediately approached them, and once in earshot, he asked, How much do you guys think I should offer item number 22? Alice quietly read the details of the offer indicated by Daniel, and after thinking about it for a few moments, she said, would go for a million and a half. It's a bit high, but we have the money, and with these resources we should be all right for a very long time. Very well, a million and a half it is then. Said Daniel. Then, without looking up from the list, he slowly walked away while saying, I'll leave you two alone, so you can play couple some more. Once decided on the price to offer, Daniel approached the clerk. Using the quill and ink he was given, Daniel wrote his offers right next to the items. He then put the list back into his envelope, and gave it back to the clerk along with the quill and ink. He then left the hall, and found a quiet spot to sit and wait for the bidding stage to end. As he sat on the bench he and the rest of the group occupied earlier, Daniel noticed Lagarde approaching along with a group of young men and women. He walked in the middle, and seemed to be the center of their attention. Lagarde stopped right in front of him, and with a proud expression, he said, Hey Dan, I've assured these guys that you had already comprehended a big deal of Earth essence. But they don't believe me. Want to give them a demonstration. Chapter 83 A Dangerous Miscalculation You are listening at NovelFull.audio with nothing else to do, Daniel accepted Lagarde's request. He decided to show the group of cultivators the same thing he had seen when he was comprehending earth essence. So, he created a large shell of earth essence made out of hundreds of ever-changing minerals. He then formed an entrance for moonlight to go in. The light was reflected from side to side, forming a picture of bright colors. Aha! What did I tell you? He is a prodigious spiritual cultivator. Said Lagarde proudly to the shocked young men and women which had followed him. After a minute the shell started to dissipate, and sounds of disappointment reached Daniel's ears. Once the shell disappeared completely, a few members of the group said goodbye and left. Lagarde nodded at Daniel and bumped his fist on his shoulder. A small group of twenty or so years old girls didn't leave, and instead, approached Daniel. They wanted to comment on how cute he looked, how much he reminded them of their little brothers, or how good he would have looked together with their baby sisters, but the moment they got too close, their hands would simply slide off of Daniel's body right before touching him. Lagarde was, of course, aware of what was happening. Daniel was using spatial essence in order to prevent people from touching him. After a few more failed attempts, before the girls could start asking for an explanation, Lagarde approached them and said, Now ladies, let's leave the young man alone. After a performance, an artist needs his privacy. The girls looked at Daniel with disappointment, and waved him goodbye. They then left with Lagarde. Once again, Daniel found himself alone in the yard. An hour had passed, and the moon was full and high in the sky. Daniel observed the bright moonlight that bathed his surroundings in a gentle light. For just a few moments, he began to comprehend light essence. Then, he sat quietly on a bench, and waited for the silent auction to be over. The Warehouse, 23.50 Ding dong Daniel's uneventful and quiet wait was interrupted by the chime of a bell. He didn't know what it meant, but from the reactions of the other people, he guessed that the chime indicated the imminent conclusion of the bidding phase of the silent auction. He walked back into the main hall, and in there, he found a large amount of chairs put in an orderly fashion. Most of these chairs were already occupied, and from the movement of the guests, Daniel had guessed that they were numbered as well. 
Daniel quickly found his seat, where his friends happened to be sitting already. On his left, were Alice and Heimart, while to his right, were Jirai and Ligart. Ten minutes passed in the blink of an eye. In front of the seated people was a podium, behind which, the middle-aged man that had welcomed the guests, was standing quietly. Every couple of minutes, he would remind the guests to finish writing their offers, and to put the list back in the envelope along with their identity stones. At exactly midnight, his loud voice was heard through the entire hall. It say, the first stage of this silent auction has terminated. In about five minutes, we will announce the winners of the various items. Please, stay seated. After exactly five minutes, an attendant approached the podium and handed a list identical to those the others had received. But instead of being empty on the side, this list had the winning offer, and the number of the winner. For the item number one, a batch of 9 million beast cores of the first rank, 250,000 beast cores of the second rank, and 25,000 beast cores of the third rank. The winner is Guest number 59 with an offer of 1,950,000 gold coins. Said the middle-aged man with a loud and clear voice. Daniel was guest number 107, so he could see guest number 59 just a few rows in front of him. He looked reasonably happy. Not only because he had won this batch of low-level beast cores, but also because he had placed the same bet on the following four items. Daniel wasn't aware of it, but this man was one of the vice leaders of one of the biggest blacksmith groups in the Crehan Empire. Something that blacksmiths groups usually did, was to accept unranked people in mass before helping them reach the first or second rank of martial cultivation. These people would then work on forging low-level items that, after being sold, would serve as a return of the investment. The cost of a weapon of lesser quality was many times higher than that of a single first-rank beast core. Usually, an unranked would advance into the first rank in a week's time and through the use of at least five beast cores, therefore, it was an extremely beneficial deal for blacksmiths groups all over the world, as blacksmiths could work for dozens of years. This process was a short-term investment that brought great profits, and of course, existed in many different levels. Metals and materials not always could be treated by low-dot-level cultivators, so, blacksmiths associations usually had a small circle of very talented blacksmiths which they nurtured to higher stages of cultivation. Unsurprisingly, the following four deals had been successfully purchased by the same man, and at the same price. For item number six, a batch of 1,000. The announcements continued slowly, until finally, it was the turn of Daniel's items. For item number 20.1, a batch of 250 beast cores of the 5th rank, and 50 beast cores of the 6th rank. The winner is. Guest number 107 with an offer of 690.1001 gold coins. What? Suddenly burst out a man in the crowd. That's just one gold coin more than what I've offered. How is that possible? You've said that it was impossible to spy on another person's offer. The man was furious, and the coincidence was too big to pass as such. Sir, I assure you that it is impossible that someone might have spied on your offer. Every quill pen, sheet of paper, and even the ink, has been enchanted by a spiritual cultivator at the ninth rank, and with a high comprehension of spatial essence. The very items do not exist in this dimension, and the only reason why you were able to use and see them yourself, was thanks to the wisp of key that you've left within the identity stone. Please be seated. This is only an extremely odd coincidence. Said the middle-aged man after finishing to explain the whole safety protocols adopted by his auction house. The man turned to look at Daniel with a dubious look. Within the crowd, the father of the family of three people was looking at Daniel. On his face, was a faint smile. What are you smiling at? Asked his wife. The faint smile disappeared from his face as he said, I think you're going to get an answer to the question you've been bothering me with for the past two weeks, bl.net, for item number 20.2, a batch of 5,000 beast cores of the third level, 200 beast cores of the fourth level, 150 beast cores of the fifth level, 70 beast cores of the sixth level, 
and three beast cores of the seventh level. The winner is. The middle-aged man looked at Daniel with a faint smile, then continued, guest number 107 with an offer of 1,500,000 gold coins. He then looked at the previous man, and said, the second offer for this item was of 1,450,000 gold coins. For item number 20.3, a batch of 200 beast cores of the 6th rank, and 10 beast cores of the 7th rank. The winner is. Suddenly, the face of the middle-aged man contorted in confusion. Once again, he looked at Daniel and said, guest number 107. 3,880.6 thousand. And one gold coin. That can't be. Shouted another man in the crowd. It's the same thing that happened to that man. It's just one gold coin above my offer. The host felt lost for a few moments. He then regained his wits and said, order please. Be seated. We will definitely investigate the matter. Who is the object going to? Asked the man who had just shouted. Suddenly, Daniel stood up and said, if I may, I would like to explain how this happened. Please. Said the host. Daniel turned to look at the host, and with a matter dot of dot fact tone, he said, it's nothing too complicated. I've simply heard them say their offers out loud. That's bullshit. Brat, do you think that you can make a fool out of me here? I'll tear you into pieces if you don't speak the truth. Shouted the second highest bidder of the item number 20.1. I am 15 years old. And I am a spiritual cultivator of the fourth rank. Are you implying that I possess the power to see through the spatial limitation imposed by the warehouse? With that level of reasoning, no wonder you've said your bid out loud. Said Daniel with a disdainful tone. You fucking brat. I'll kill you. Shouted the man while dashing towards Daniel. But before the man could reach Daniel, he disappeared in thin air. Daniel was shocked. He couldn't have possibly teleported the man away, as that man had a higher cultivation than his. Someone within the crowd or the staff had teleported the man away. Within the crowd, the father of the family was smiling once more. By his side, his wife looked at Daniel and said, you weren't kidding. Twice as cunning as you were. Dad, do you know that guy? Asked the platinum blonde girl. The man turned to look at his daughter, and with a loving expression he said, yes. And you'll meet him too one day. Once the first furious man disappeared, the second man barked a few threats and left the all in rage as well. Daniel sat back on his chair, and waited for the auction to end. The only interest Daniel's group had for this event now, was the offer for their weapons. It took almost an hour of waiting before the middle-aged man announced the numbers of the highest bidders, and the various offers. Two of the four batches of weapons had gone for seven millions each, while the remaining two had been sold for five millions and five hundred thousand gold coins each. The total amount was a whopping twenty point five millions of gold coins. After an additional half hour, the silent auction concluded, and Daniel and the rest were finally able to obtain their items and leave the auction house. They had entered with 40,000 weapons of decent level and 6,000 weapons of the good level. When they came out, they had obtained 5,000 beast cores of the third rank, 200 beast cores of the fourth rank, 400 beast cores of the fifth rank, 220 beast cores of the sixth rank, 13 beast cores of the 7th rank, and finally 20,178,359 gold coins. I'd say it went pretty well. Said Legarte while walking behind the rest of the group. Daniel turned around, and with a satisfied expression, he said, it certainly did. Now comes the boring part. Heimart looked at Daniel, and with a scolding tone he said, if you're going to think of cultivating for long periods of time as boring. Then you're never going to reach a high. He then stopped, and after realizing who he was talking to, he said, actually, never mind. With an uncomfortable expression, Legarte said, so. We are going to take turns on who stays outside and guard the pocket dimension. Chapter 84 Solitary Cultivation You are listening at novelfull.audio 
After a day spent shopping for materials and furniture, the group entered a restaurant and sat for dinner. So, how do we decide? Asked Lagarde once again. During the day, the group had talked extensively about their options. In the end, they had narrowed down the decision to two. The first option, was to purchase a patch of land in which to place the castle, while the second, was to leave someone outside of the pocket dimension that could keep the rings safe while the rest cultivated. Both options had pros and cons. For example, leaving the castle outside would allow them to cultivate in peace, and maybe even expand. But they were not powerful enough to protect their territory from invaders yet. In the second option, they would be safe within the pocket dimension. Unfortunately, someone would have to stay outside to protect the rest while they cultivated. A mistake, and they could all end up in the hands of a powerful cultivator. There was a third option, which after a bit of deliberation, had been discarded. And that option was to allow Daniel's spatial essence teacher to keep the ring while they stayed inside to cultivate. The reason why this option had been discarded, was because Daniel still wasn't sure if he could trust the man or not. The two had an agreement, and were not that close. What the rest of the group didn't know, was that Daniel already had a clear idea on how to solve this problem. He simply hadn't found a way to justify it yet. It was during this dinner that he said, I know how to solve this. He looked at the rest of the group one at a time, and said, I have the highest mobility, I can call the middle-aged man in case of emergency. And I have the fastest speed in cultivation. I should stay outside and cultivate on my own. That's not fair. You might end up being alone for days, maybe even weeks at a time. Beast cores of the sixth rank take time to fully consume. Said Heimart with a disapproving tone. The reason why Daniel had decided this way was simple. The group feature of the karmic system. Within the group feature of the karmic system, there was a passive shared effect similar to his own, time is precious. The effect was the same, and the only differences were the magnitude of the effect, and the fact that it included the entire group. The only rule that needed to be respected in order for this effect to take place, was that the group members needed to be either in the group's ground, or in the presence of the group leader. Therefore, if Daniel decided to enter the ring along with most of the others, he would take away the chance to cultivate with an increased progression from one of his friends. I'll be fine. I'll keep training with the middle-aged man in spatial essence and I won't be alone. Plus, I can enter the ring whenever I want. Lied Daniel before looking at the ring and saying. Speaking of which, before I forget. He then put his hand over Heimart's open palm, and disappeared. Leaving the ring to fall in Heimart's hand. Daniel reappeared inside the castle. Specifically, he was within the mess hall, where Roly, Imblen, and the two kids were currently having dinner. Hey Dan. Said Roly with a happy tone. For the past couple of weeks, he had enjoyed comprehending the water essence thanks to the water sphere Daniel had given to him. Hi. Look, before we all start cultivating, I was thinking about installing the water sphere in this dimension space. You would still be able to use it, I'll make sure to install it in a visible place. But it has to stay inside pocket dimension. Said Daniel without beating around the bush. Roly immediately took the water sphere out of his ring, and threw it at Daniel. With a big smile he said, I think it's a great idea. Daniel immediately teleported outside of the castle. He was now about a thousand meters away from it in the opposite direction where the earth elementals resided. He then locked the water sphere on the space floor. In a matter of seconds, water started to propagate and fill the entire space. Daniel could finally feel the moisture in the air, which now felt almost identical to that of the outside world. The only places where the water did not reach, were the earth sanctuary that now had become a large rocky island, and the castle, which still possessed a shield of wind essence embedded in the formation. After installing the water sphere, Daniel decided to proceed with the purchase of the group version of, Time is Precious. After the window of the shared karmic effects opened in his head, he purchased it at the cost of 500,000 karma points. 
Then, he opened the group windows. Underscore 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 group of the karmic systems wielder. Name Group of the Karmic Systems Wielder, Provisory, Number of Members, Details 6 Overall Karma 254 Karmic Effects Time is Precious LV.1, Group Underscore 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 shared karmic effects details reputation details Underscore 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 Daniel was enthusiast about this group's feature. Thanks to the group version of Time is Precious, he would be able to increase his friend's very talent in comprehension and learning. It was like they had a very weakened version of the system themselves. Luckily, the effects were still small, and would hardly be noticeable by the rest of the group. At best, they would be happy about their oddly fast speed in cultivation, and blame it on their motivation. Of course, this also came with strings attached. If Daniel ever decided to go all out with this group upgrade feature, sooner or later he would have to find a reasonable explanation for the changes. A few ideas had come to mind, and the best ones were two. The first one was to comprehend time essence, and claim to be able to fasten the speed of cultivation while at the same time slow down their aging. The second excuse was to learn alchemy, and claim to have invented a pill capable of increasing a person's affinity between key and beast essence. Naturally, these ideas were still at their embryo stages. It was still premature to think about this, as the cost for the next level of, time is precious, group, was of a full million karma points. So, he didn't expect to feel the need to explain himself anytime soon. Daniel teleported back next to Roly, and after telling him the position of the water sphere, he left the ring once again, reappearing back on his seat at the restaurant. The group enjoyed their dinner for a couple of hours, until finally, the rest of the group accepted Daniel's proposition to leave him in charge of protecting the pocket dimension. The next day, they bid Daniel farewell, and entered the ring to cultivate. Now alone, Daniel teleported multiple times in Drester space, and once outside of the city, he opened a rift in the ground, then jumped into it, closing it back behind him. Ten months later, 20,000 kilometers away from the borders of Carolus, was a city called Golden City. This city was a city.state, and did not belong to any kingdom or empire. Most inhabitants were unranked humans, and their main job was tending to the fields. What these unranked humans cultivated, wasn't food, or at least not all of it. What these unranked humans cultivated, were alchemical plants and herbs. The large fields surrounded the Golden City completely, only leaving small strips of space in between them for the clean and well-defined roads. These roads were filled with carriages that went in both directions. The Golden City wasn't too large, and yet, it was very luxurious and lively. This city's name didn't come from the fact that it was made out of gold. The reason for its name, was that it belonged to the alchemical association called Golden Cauldron. Inside the Golden Cauldron's headquarters building, were a few different offices, and inside one of these offices, two teenage girls sat quietly in front of a desk. Behind this desk, an old-looking man sat. His expression was devoid of good emotions, as he looked at the two girls in front of him. If Daniel were here, he would have recognized all three of these people. The two girls were Rayla and Maya, while the old man was the silver alchemist, his teacher of spiritual cultivation. I've told you, I don't know where he is. He might have ended up in a radius of hundreds of thousand kilometers. He could be anywhere, said the old alchemist. While secretly clawing at the armrests of her chair, Rayla said with a near-desperate tone, 
but you've sent him somewhere. It was your artifact. How could you not know where it takes? The artifact wasn't mine. It belonged to my family for generations, and it had been found by one of my predecessors. I didn't know where it took him. If I had a choice, or a different spatial artifact, I would have used that. But that was all I had. Said the old alchemist, seemingly for the tenth time. He then looked at the depressed expressions of the two girl, and with a reassuring tone he said, Look, I've never seen someone as talented as your brother. Unless he is stupid enough to go and provoke powerful people left and right, he'll find his way back home. You two should focus on your own cultivation. My brother was always all I had. He took care of me when we were at our lowest. If he won't be back soon, I'll go looking for him instead. Said Rayla with a determined tone. It is certain that he is alive. So wait here, and keep cultivating. You won't help your brother by getting yourself killed out in the world. You may be talented, but you are only a third-rank spiritual cultivator. Responded the old man, almost as if rehearsing the lines he had to repeat over and over again in the past year. He then said, Go now. Your lessons are about to start. The two girls stood up, and after a slight bow, they left the room together. Rayla couldn't help but be swallowed once again by the feeling of helplessness she had felt for almost a year. Maya looked at her, and after giving her a comforting hug, she said, You know your brother better than anyone else. Nothing will stop him from seeing you again. The two then walked towards their class. In the past eight months, Rayla and Maya had cultivated thanks to the support of the Silver Alchemist. Rayla had reached the late third rank of spiritual cultivation, while Maya had cultivated to the early fourth rank of martial cultivation. Before sending them to the Golden City, Master Kai had made sure to pass on to Maya a large number of martial arts. Included those which belonged to the ruling house. The two spent their days cultivating and practicing spiritual and martial arts. In secret, they also made long-term plans on how to go look for Daniel. The only thing they lacked, was a general direction. Crehan Empire, Dresder. 23.10 NV.12 km east from Dresder, was a rocky patch of land. It was covered in blades of grass and moss, and it looked like nobody had come here for a long time. Suddenly, the ground started to tremble. The tremble soon turned into an earthquake, and in just a few moments, the rocky ground split into two. From between these two large rocky walls, a young man flew out in silence. His key was vibrant, and from the outside, it appeared to be at the peak of the fifth stage of cultivation. But the truth was different. Chapter 85 Ten months later you are listening at NovelFull.audio In the middle of one of Dresster squares, the middle-aged man who had teached spatial essence to Daniel, stood quietly behind his stand. On the stand a few dozen jewels were placed orderly. Each of them were pocket dimensions of different kind and size. The line in front of his stall was extremely long, but unfortunately, he wasn't able to be happy about it. He had been showing up at the square for two weeks now, but unfortunately, he hadn't had any luck in finding a replacement for Daniel. A young man approached the stand and said, I would like to buy one of these. How much are you selling them for? They are not for sale. Responded the middle-aged man with an annoyed tone. The face of the young man twisted in confusion. He then said, if they are not for sale, why are you displaying them, the fact that you don't know says it all. Now leave. Responded the middle-aged man, now slightly irritated. For the past ten months, the middle-aged man had bet it all on Daniel's honesty, and proceeded with his research. But now, only one month and a half was left before the gathering of experts, and he hadn't heard a word from Daniel ever since he had joined the Legion. At two months from the event, he had started to consider that, maybe, Daniel wouldn't have showed up. So he stopped with his research, and used his old method to look for another person to train in spatial essence, and to bring to the gathering of experts. He had such an urgency to find somebody else, that he didn't even have time to shave or fix himself. It was now a well-dressed old man's turn to approach the stall, 
but just as he was about to talk, the middle-aged man stood up and looked east. Then, he disappeared taking the stall with him. When he appeared again, he was standing right in front of a young man. With a face filled with enthusiasm, he said, I thought you would come back in time. A deal is a deal. And even if you haven't finished teaching me all you know about spatial essence, there is still time for that. Responded the young man with a matter dot of dot fact tone. There is something different about you. Muttered the middle-aged man. On the outside the young man was smiling, but within his mind, he was looking at a window that he had purposely made appear. Underscore 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 Dan Heal. Karmic Systems Wielder. Age. 15 Rank. Peak Rank 6 of Martial Cultivation, Perfect Body. Peak rank 6 of spiritual cultivation, perfect connection, karma. 0 underscore 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 weapons masteries, details, martial arts, details, skills, details, spells, details. Underscore 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 reap what you've sown time is precious LV.5 reduced cost LV.4 second chance LV.1 karma X luck system upgrades details Underscore 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 Where are your friends? Asked the middle-aged man while looking around. Daniel gently tapped on his pocket dimension with his index finger. He then said, Mind if I leave the ring with you? I'd like to see them. Sure, go ahead. Responded the middle-aged man. Daniel tossed the ring to the middle-aged man, and before it could even reach his hand, Daniel disappeared inside it. The middle-aged man grabbed the ring in mid-air, and after looking at it with a smile on his face, he teleported back in Dresder. During the ten months spent cultivating, Daniel had seen his friends only twice. The last time being five months ago. He teleported inside the castle, and once again, he found that its furnishing had changed. The castle now looked lively, and closer to the living space of a royal family. The first person he saw was Imblen, which was standing in the hall and giving lessons about cultivation to the two kids. From what Daniel could see, she had reached the peak of the fifth rank of martial cultivation. Daniel. Said Imblen while walking towards him. She immediately hugged him and said, I've missed you. Why didn't you come more often? You could have come out as well. Responded Daniel with a faint smile on his face. Sure. If you hadn't hidden in a tiny hole underground every single time we came out. The one time we came out, it was so crowded that I've ended up flat against Lagarde. Well, I'm here now. How are you and the kids? Asked Daniel kindly. Imblen smiled at him and said, We are good. I've basically read every single book in the martial wing of the library. Don't ask me how many martial arts I've learned though. About the kids. She then turned to look at the two kids, that now were almost one year older, and with a sweet smile she said, They are learning. That's good. Said Daniel before disappearing once again. When he reappeared, he was in a martial training room. Inside it, Jirai was practicing a martial art he had found within the martial wing of the library. The moment Daniel appeared, he stopped. He then turned to look at Daniel, and he said in the human language, Greeting warrior. Good see you. Hi Jirai. Responded Daniel kindly. Jirai was slightly taller than before. 
Not enough for the others to notice, but enough for him, since he hadn't seen him even once since he had started to cultivate. On his chin, a hint of dark blonde unshaven beard could be noticed. When Daniel noticed Jiraiya's cultivation at the peak of the sixth rank, he felt impressed by his talent in cultivation. Having finished his karma points after only four months, Daniel's maximum speed of cultivation had slowed down by 80.3%. At that speed, the absolute prodigious talent of Jirai had allowed him to reach his same rank of cultivation. Daniel recognized the two martial arts that Jirai was practicing immediately. The first one was a martial art called Tornado Slash, and it teached how to overwhelm one's opponent with attacks thrown during a constant rotation of the body. The second martial art was called From Part to Part, and it teached how to efficiently use piercing attacks. Jirai not only was using these two martial arts at a near-perfect level, but he was also using them at the same time. In fact, one could say that these two arts were merged to such a perfection, that Jirai had created a new martial art from them. If Daniel were to name this new martial art based simply on how Jiraiya's movements looked, he would call it, Confusing Cuts. After seeing that Jirai was fine, Daniel teleported once again. He appeared in another martial training room, inside which, Lagarde and Heimart were sparring, while Alice was spectating. Before any of the three could notice him, Daniel checked them up one by one. Alice and Heimart were both at the early sixth rank, while to Daniel's shock, Lagarde had passed both of them in rank, and had reached the mid-sixth rank first. Daniel knew perfectly that Lagarde's talent wasn't any better than his cousin. Not to talk about Alice. The only reason why something like this might have possibly happened, could only because they hadn't focused on cultivation like they were supposed to. I see you guys have been slacking off. Said Daniel with teasing tone. The three immediately turned to look at the direction from which the familiar voice came from. Right after, they noticed Daniel standing quietly, with his usual neutral expression and cheeky smile on his face. I haven't slacked off. Want to spar with me? Said Lagarde with a challenging tone. Heimart and Alice looked at one another, and in embarrassment, they said at the same time, we have focused more on, but right after reaching this point, Heimart proceeded to say, dot practicing martial arts, while instead, Alice said, dot renovating the castle, sure. Said Daniel while throwing a cheeky smile at them. I still have to say hi to Roly. See you guys back in a bit. He then said before suddenly disappearing. When he, he was standing above water, and right in front of a small island made out of ice. On it, Roly was sitting quietly while meditating. Roly had inherited Daniel's comprehension of water essence. So, he was completely capable of verifying Roly's stage of comprehension by simply looking at the ice construct Roly had summoned to keep himself floating. Currently, Roly was showing a comprehension of 80.5% of water essence, and a cultivation at the peak of the fifth stage. Overall, Roly, along with Jirai, was the one who had made the most progress. Unwilling to disturb him, Daniel decided to leave. It wouldn't take long before Roly would reach the full capacity of the water sphere's comprehension, which was 90%. They would have all the time in the world to talk after that. Currently, Daniel had an adequate spiritual essence to produce a perfect earth sphere, but since he didn't have a single karma point, he decided to avoid the earth elementals and leave the ring instead. When Daniel reappeared in the outside space, he found himself inside a very elegant living room. Next to him, the middle-aged man was talking to a beautiful platinum blonde woman which, to Daniel, seemed familiar. When he appeared, the woman stopped her conversation with the middle-aged man and said, You must be Daniel. We meet again. Daniel tried to remember where he and this woman could possibly have met, but failed. My most sincere apologies ma'am, but have we ever met before? Asked Daniel with a curious yet apologetic tone. The woman turned back towards the middle-aged man and glared at him for a few seconds, then she turned back towards Daniel and said in a gentle tone. We did not meet. I recognized you from the silent auction at the warehouse. I assume you are not used to seeing my husband not looking like a tramp. Indeed, I am not. 
said Daniel while looking sideways at the middle-aged man. He then continued, I actually don't know much about him. Or about his family. That doesn't surprise me. Come, let's talk. Said the woman with a polite tone. She then pointed at a chair, and sat on the one next to it. The middle-aged man ignored the woman's action, and instead, he walked into another room and disappeared. First of all, presentations. My husband's name is Edmund Saulet, and I am Emily Saulet. You have already met our daughter Elysia. We are the Saulet family. Said the platinum blonde woman in an extremely polite tone, as if she was presenting herself to someone worthy of her respect. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance. My name is Dan, of the Heal family. Responded Daniel just as respectfully. The pleasure is all mine, Dan of the Heels. Excuse the poor manners of my husband. He isn't used to having people around. He is usually very focused on his projects and studies. You must have made a real good impression to manage making him pick you for the gathering. Said the woman while looking at Daniel with interest. Daniel suddenly smiled and said, It seems that the key to your husband's heart is a genuine interest for spatial essence. I was just lucky. I have plenty of those kind of keys in store. The woman's interest towards Daniel deepened even further. She then asked, The gathering will be in a month and a half. Are you prepared? Prepared. Wasn't it a gathering to discuss a strange event regarding time essence? Asked Daniel with an extremely confused tone. No wonder you looked so calm. Muttered the woman in a low voice. She then said, the gathering of experts is not only a discussion between experts. Students will be examined and tested before their teacher will be deemed worthy of joining the gathering of experts. She then paused for a moment before continuing, you will have to face the most talented disciples of the most powerful experts of the Crehan Empire. I really hope that you are ready for it. Chapter 86 The first of many old grudges you are listening at novelfull.audio Will Lady Emily attempt to enter the gathering of experts as well? Asked Daniel with a polite tone. Lady Emily smiled at Daniel and responded, Yes. My daughter will act as my champion, and will compete to allow me to join the gathering. She is already in the capital, preparing for the event. Daniel had a good impression of Elysia, the miss of the Saulette family. She was direct and yet not too serious. She could laugh at a joke and fire back right away. Unfortunately, their interaction had been interrupted by the young man in green martial attire. The two talked for a few minutes before Lady Emily stood up and said, You should go and prepare now, even with my husband's powers, it takes a week to get to the capital. She then gave him another key flag with her husband's key trapped within. Daniel got up as well, and after bowing politely to the woman, he took the key flag and disappeared in thin air. When he reappeared, he was standing in the middle of Dresder. Daniel's karma count, for the first time since he had obtained the karmic system, was at a neutral zero. He had cultivated until the very moment he had finished his karma points, and now, he needed to, once again accumulate them in the most tiring way possible. Suddenly, one after another, his group members started to exit the pocket dimension and appear next to him. Finally. Fresh air. Said Lagarde with an enthusiastic tone. Imblin and Roly were those who had stayed within the castle the longest, so they were especially happy about being out in the open. Roly, which was the only one who hadn't seen Daniel yet, approached Daniel and said, It's good to see you. He then gave him a friendly hug. It's good to see you too, Roly. I've checked you out when you were training. Your progress are impressive. Said Daniel in a friendly manner. I can't complain. I was so focused that I think that I've reached my highest speed in cultivation ever during these past ten months. Responded Roly while embarrassingly brushing his hair. Just like Daniel had thought, the group had noticed their increased speed in progression. But since their increased speed wasn't too different from their normal speed, they had explained it as an odd state of focus reached thanks to their focus in cultivation. 
I remember something about this in the formation project. Something about the castle being able to help in reaching a deep state of concentration. Said Daniel with a vague tone. Trying to hint that the change they felt might have been thanks to an unknown effect installed along with the castle's formation. So. What are we going to do now? Asked Heimart curiously. Daniel had an odd look on his face. He wanted to start a mission of the Everything Counts chain, but it would seem odd to roam around Dresder while helping people in such a large group. So, he looked at the group and said, we only have a few days before we'll have to depart to the capital. Why don't we split and meet back here in five days? Surprisingly, none of them objected. After a few words, Heimart walked towards a lively street filled with people, and left on his own. The next ones to leave were Roly and Imblen, which went in another direction while bringing the two kids along. After them, Legart looked at Daniel and said, I'll go see if I can find you a wife Daniel. You are almost sixteen now. He then left while giggling. After Legart left, Alice waved her hand in salute and walked towards a direction that none of the other had taken. Daniel sensed with his spiritual essence that, after only twenty meters, she had entered an alley to the side of the road, and changed route. She was going towards Heimart's position. Jirai bowed towards Daniel respectfully, and said, five days. He then left as well. Daniel couldn't help but smile at the behavior of his comrades. He then regained his composure, and started to think about helping others. In just a moment, a new window appeared in his head. Asterisk primary quest started. Everything help star dot description. Offer your help to people in need. Third objective set, repeatable. Offer your help to 500 people within Dresder. Reward. 20,000 karma points slash Dresder reputation plus 5% slash group reputation plus 0.0000007%. Time limit. Five day with a clear objective in mind, Daniel started to sense his surrounding. The very moment he found someone that appeared to be in need of help, he teleported away. From simple things like giving money to a wanderer or helping someone move heavy items, to more serious things like preventing a raping attempt or stopping an assault. Daniel didn't miss any of them. After four long days, the much awaited mission update appeared in his mind. Underscore 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 everything helps third objective completed, January 20th, reward. 20,000 karma points slash dressed reputation plus 5% slash group reputation plus 0.0000007%. Underscore 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 with an exhausted expression. Daniel finally sat on a bench to rest. The events of the past four days had caused Daniel's view of human nature had changed drastically once again. He had seen many odd things, like people with positive karma that tried to rob people with bad karma, a girl with a very high amount of positive karma that kept her boyfriend chained in her house and tortured him for fun, and even an old man with relatively high bad karma that walked around distributing food to orphan kids. For the first time, Daniel started to think that his karmic system might be more detrimental to his perception of good and bad than it would be useful. He relied too much on the its ability to read people's karma, and that had to stop. After a few minutes of thinking, Daniel came to the decision of checking a person's karma only after forming his own opinion on them. His ability to read karma would then become one of the details that contributed to his opinion, instead of being the whole base on which his opinion of a person's character formed. Thanks to this way of thinking, Daniel had come to appreciate Legarde's natural talent of distinguishing between good and bad people even more. With only a day missing before the appointed time, Daniel decided to stroll around the city and relax. But before he could even leave the square, he felt his key being erased from one of his key flags. 
In the blink of an eye, Daniel had disappeared from where he was standing, and had appeared in mid-air right above a busy street. In this busy street, Lagarde was lying on the ground while covered in bruises while surrounded by a group of cultivators. Most of these cultivators were at the peak of the fifth rank, while the remaining ten, were at various stages of the sixth rank of cultivation. Daniel recognized these people as part of a group which belonged to the mercenary horde. They hadn't learned the specific name of this group, but Daniel remembered that he had killed at least two of their members. The group was surrounding Lagarde and looked like they were waiting for somebody else to arrive. Some of them presented light injuries, clearly caused by Lagarde's attempt to fight back. Daniel quietly observed the situation from above a building's roof. Surely enough, a middle-aged man dressed in a similar attire to the one the rest were wearing, approached the site at high speed. He then stopped at the edge of the group, which split in order to let him through. Envied it, he is not the one who killed your son, but one of the killer's group. Said one of the injured young men while looking hatefully at Lagarde. Daniel was really surprised to see that the middle-aged man was at the early seventh rank of martial cultivation. This man looked at Lagarde and said, You. You are coming with me. After spending a few days together, you'll tell me everything about where to find the rest of your group of vermins. His tone was vicious and filled with repressed killing intent. The man approached the injured Lagarde, and just as he was about to knock him out, a voice that came from up in the sky stopped him. Okay, that's enough. Said Daniel while walking down an invisible flight of stairs. It's him. Shouted the injured young man. That's the one who killed your son. I've seen it with my own eyes. After hearing the young man's words, the man immediately unsheathed his sword and pounced at Daniel. The whole action took an instant to play, but when the man expected to feel the edge of his sword pierce through Daniel's flesh, he instead heard the familiar sound of the edge of his sword split the air in two. A light blue key attack kept going in the air after the slashing motion, cutting straight through the building behind Daniel and coming out from the other side. After a moment of surprise, the man turned around in order to find Daniel, which was currently sitting next to Lagarde, with one of his hands pressed against the latter's shoulder. Clear and milky white essence could be clearly seen seeping into Lagarde's skin and slowly closing his wounds. You are too impulsive for your age. Let's talk. Said Daniel with a neutral voice. The man showed a face filled with a rage deeper than ever. He then said with a vicious voice, You. You have killed my boy. There is nothing you can say to apologize for what you've done. I must have your head before the sun sets, or I will never be able to feel like a man again. His eyes were getting watery from how deep his rage towards Daniel, and his sadness towards the loss of his son were. All those whom I've killed had already initiated an attack that, had I not avoided, would have killed me instead. I never meant to apologize. Responded Daniel in a matter. Of dot fact tone. He then said, I am not responsible for the loss I've caused by killing someone who tried to kill me. But by solving this matter with words, I might prevent the rest of your family from feeling that kind of loss once again. Daniel words were true. During the battle in the rocky forest he hadn't killed anyone who didn't attempt to take his life, or one of his friend's lives. The reason was simple. He did not like to kill. The man seemed to have calmed down on the outside, but those who knew him, knew that he was only focusing on the battle. He looked at Daniel and barked, enough talking. He then pounced at Daniel with such a speed, that it looked like he had teleported. His sword was high up in the air, and just as he was about to slash downwards, a dozen of small rocky spikes burst out from the ground and attempted to pierce his body. A shield suddenly appeared on his left arm, which he used to defend himself from Daniel's attack. The shield was a high-level weapon, and was made with very tough materials, but they could do nothing against Daniel's comprehension of earth essence. The tips of the spikes suddenly turned into diamonds, which easily perforated the shield. About to be impaled, the man stepped over the internal part of the shield, and jumped high up in the air. Just as he was about to land on the ground and attempt another attack, an enormous rocky hand burst out from underground, and caught the man in the air. 
The man immediately tried to struggle, and at first he managed to free his arms by overpowering Daniel's spiritual essence. When it seemed like the man was about to free himself, he felt the rock that was keeping him in place turn into sand. After only a seconds, the sand had become so fine that it could be mistaken for dust. It was at this moment that the man started to feel the moisture increase inside it. Slowly, water filtered into the sand bit by bit. This went on until the dusty clump of fine sand became saturated with water and turned into a floating clump of quicksand. Without a solid surface on which he could make lever on, the man pointlessly tried to swim out of the quicksand. You bastard! Let me out of here! shouted the man furiously. Daniel wanted to finish this quickly, so he changed the air composition around the man's head into one devoid of oxygen, and making him faint after a bit more than five minutes. Once out cold, Daniel dropped him on the ground, and teleported away with Legart. Chapter 87 Friendship, Dreams, and a New Lesson You Are Listening at NovelFull.Audio After healing Legart's injuries, Daniel left the ring to him and teleported back into the pocket dimension. He now had enough karma points and the required power to fulfill his promise. He appeared within the Earth Elemental Sanctuary. The moment he appeared, a few randomly placed stones started to move into the shape of a giant completely made out of stone. Once complete, this giant started to shrink and approach Daniel. Ednel.co, Daniel. It's good to see you again. Said Buriath while curving his rocky lips into a genuine smile. Buriath. I've come to fulfill my promise. Responded Daniel while smiling back at him. Buriath tilted his head in confusion and asked, Already. Already. Said Daniel while reaching with his hand. The next moment, the perfect earth treasure appeared in his palm. Without waiting to see the earth elemental's reaction to his move, Daniel started to surround the perfect treasure with his spiritual essence. He then turned it into pure and perfect earth essence, and fed it to the earth treasure. One by one, Daniel shaped the earth essence into thousands of forms and combinations, and demonstrated all the effect it caused by mixing earth with other essences. It took Daniel more than ten hours and half of the karma points he had just obtained to finally complete the perfect earth essence sphere. The sphere looked like a precious gem with thousands of faces, and each face was composed of a different mineral. Some of which were so clear that one could notice the sphere's stony core through them. The earth essence emitted by the sphere was so pure and heavy that, if not controlled, the sphere would be able to instantaneously fill the entirety of the pocket dimension in stone. Daniel approached Buriath, which was looking at Daniel with shaky legs. He then handed the sphere to him. Why dot you, art dot really did it? Said Buriath with an emotional tone. The rest of the young elementals immediately approached Buriath and started to stare at the perfect earth essence. As I've promised. Responded Daniel with a large smile on his face. In our future travels, we will find a quiet place for your race to live peacefully. Buriath couldn't help but split his enthusiastic looks between the sphere and Daniel. Then, after a minute of thinking, the smile on his face disappeared as he said. You have been fair with me human. He then looked at the rest of the younger earth elementals, and continued, I don't believe it is my turn to guide the future of the earth elementals. I think I have fulfilled my purpose in life. With a serious expression, Buriath looked at Daniel and said, Please, allow us to follow you. Once again, he looked at the five earth elementals before continuing, You can teach them how to be good better than I can. Underscore 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 and five more want to join group of the karmic systems wielder. Underscore 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 I doubt there is ever going to be a better example of Earth Elemental to follow than you. Responded Daniel in a reassuring tone. 
Then, he said, but if you want to stay with us, I am not going to stop you. Buriath approached Daniel, and put one of his rocky hands over his shoulder. Then, he grabbed his wrist, turned his hand to face upwards, and left the perfect earth essence on his palm. He then stepped back twice, looked at the surrounding space, and smiled at Daniel. Daniel immediately understood what Buriatha's thoughts were. He slowly walked towards the exact center of the pocket dimension, and once there, he locked the perfect earth sphere on the floor. In an instant, the ground evolved. The amount of minerals present in the soil, when compared to the ones present before, was much higher. Valuable minerals also started to appear randomly underground. The water and wind essence spheres, now overpowered similarly to how a kid would be overpowered by a man, started to emanate slightly less essence. Earth and soil now dominated the pocket dimension, and yet, the air was still filled with breathable air, and the previously predominant sea had now turned into a small-sized lake. The pocket dimension had suddenly become the perfect habitat for earth elementals, and thanks to Daniel's group feature that added to the elemental speed and progression, Daniel could say with certainty that no other earth elemental in the world would ever experience such a good environment to grow. Once finished installing the earth sphere, Daniel left the pocket dimension. Only one day was missing before the appointed time, and he had decided to spend it in Lagarde's company. The next day, Daniel and Lagarde were the first to arrive in the square where the group was supposed to meet. In the span of an hour, the rest of the group arrived one by one. Daniel found hilarious the fact that, despite it was extremely obvious that Alice and Heimart had become intimate, they kept pretending whenever they had the chance. That very day, they had arrived separately, just like they did when they had separated five days ago. So. Did you guys have fun? Asked Daniel with his usual cheeky smile. Heimart shrugged and said, I would hardly call it a vacation. Roly and Imblin had spent the entire time taking the kids to visit various shops and buying them things. They had played the happy family despite being only good friends. They simply did it to make the kids feel a bit of affection and familiarity which they lacked as orphans. Both the shy little girl and her brother were happily finishing a large lollipop. The one who surprised Daniel the most, was Jirai. He had come back with dozens of bags full of junk, clothes, and food. He hadn't even bothered with putting them in his spatial ring. Ligart was about to joke about Jiraiya's spending spree, but as he felt Daniel's elbow hitting his ribs, he remembered in what kind of situation Jirai used to live, and that he had probably never seen any of those items before. Daniel looked at his group and said, We will depart for the capital soon. If you guys have something to do here in Dresder, this is the time to do it. The group had been wise enough to solve their unfinished business during the past few days, so when Daniel asked if they had anything else to solve, none of them spoke. Satisfied with the group's response, Daniel looked at Roly with a playful look and said, I have a surprise for you. A surprise? Asked Roly with curiosity. Something to keep yourself occupied with after you wrap things up with the water sphere. Responded Daniel while smiling. He then added, you will see once you'll enter the ring again. Roly was the only one amongst the group who didn't need Daniel's help to enter the pocket dimension. After all, he had comprehended a very small amount of spatial essence from the middle-aged man. So, he directly approached Daniel and disappeared the very next second. Daniel helped the rest of his team go back in the ring, then took out the key flag that Mrs. Saulette had given to him, and started to erase the middle-aged man's key. The very next moment, the middle-aged man appeared right next to Daniel. Are you ready to go? Asked Edmund with his usual serious expression. Daniel nodded back at him, then said, Mrs. Saulette told me that the travel will take one week. I wouldn't mind training in spatial essence for that period of time. Sure. Responded Edmund before taking a small box out of his spatial ring. He then said, I call this item a gravitational room, but in truth, it really is an extremely small pocket dimension with ever-changing gravity. That sounds interesting. Said Daniel to the middle-aged man. He then continued by asking, how far does the gravity go? 
The middle-aged man gave Daniel a weird smile, then said, from no gravity at all. To near death. Only to near death. Asked Daniel curiously. He didn't believe that a gravity capable of killing a human didn't exist. Edmund's eyes narrowed as he looked at Daniel. He then said, I wasn't willing to lose my life for the sake of learning that additional tiny bit of spatial essence. Daniel smiled at Edmund once again, then said, maybe you won't, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't either. How can I do that? Simple. Burden yourself with weight until you start hearing bones crack. Responded Edmund with a sarcastic tone, then he said, and after you start hearing your bones crack. Keep going. Of course, Edmund wasn't aware of it, but Daniel really planned on trying it. He could create an excessively heavy armor that would wait on his body and kill him. He would then go back to life just in time dissipate the weight that would kill him within the next two seconds. The use of external help in order to comprehend an essence was a common thing. Some use scorching iron to comprehend the freezing dot like feeling of when one gets burned, salt and water to burn their skin without having to use fire, and even the movement of fine sand in order to understand the flowing of water. All right kid, it's time to go, said Edmund before teleporting Daniel back into his house. Inside the living room, Edmund's wife Emily was already waiting. Without saying anything, Edmund tossed the box at Daniel, then teleported both him and his wife inside a pocket dimension. This pocket dimension wasn't large by any means, and it only contained a small-sized but elegant mansion. What was curious about this pocket dimension was that it contained many different types of essences. Amongst which were light, earth, water, wind and metal essence spheres. There was even an inactive sphere which Daniel couldn't seem to recognize. He couldn't help but stare at it. Have you seen something that caught your eye? Asked Emily with a gentle tone. What type of essence does that sphere contain? I can't feel anything from it. Asked Daniel with a curious tone. Emily smiled at Daniel and said, that's the most expensive kind of essence sphere. A time sphere. When Daniel heard the woman's words, his eyes opened wide in shock. He looked back at Emily and asked, that's a time sphere. Why does it look deactivated? It's not deactivated. It is simply set to mimic the normal flow of time. It helps with farming, responded Emily before slowly walking inside the mansion. It was at this moment that Daniel remembered where he had seen a sphere similar to this one. It was inside the greenhouse ring that the silver alchemist had given to him. After thinking about the woman's words, Daniel had a flash of enlightenment. He had always believed that time was ever dot present, but now he had realized something new. Time was not present within pocket dimensions. The moment Daniel thought of this, he also thought that it was the most obvious thing ever. But then, he started thinking about how his friends had aged a full year within the pocket dimension if there was no time flow. It didn't take long for Daniel to make a conclusion. Time flow did not affect the aging of living things. There was a reason why living mana like ki and beast essences were so different from other types of mana, and that was because living things possessed life essence. What made people age was the deterioration of their life essence, and its replacement with death essence. This was the reason why time essence could not be used to speed a person aging process. It now became all very clear to Daniel. He couldn't help but start thinking about what the possible uses of time essence could be, or how to comprehend life essence. What Daniel wasn't aware of, was that he had already come into contact with both time essence and life essence. And that was when he had consumed healing essence. Tens of thousands of years ago, when healing pills were created, humans that had comprehended bits and pieces of time essence and life essence had decided to create an item that could speed the regeneration of the human's body. The healing pill was a failed result on the attempt of creating a pill for immortality, and yet, it had been passed down as one of the most incredible inventions in history. What had been forgotten after so many years, was that healing essence was nothing more than an artificial essence created by the refined mix of time and life essence. Chapter 88 The Gathering of Experts Part 1 You are listening at novelfull.audio. 
Daniel followed Emily inside, can that time sphere be set to work differently from how it is now? Why? Do you want to comprehend time essence? Asked the woman while furrowing her eyebrows in confusion. Don't you have your hands full with spatial essence? I have a genuine interest in all sorts of essence. I will never know where my talents lie in if I don't try to study them all, right? Responded Daniel with a confident tone. The platinum blonde woman looked at Daniel with her crystal clear eyes, then said, all right. But as a martial cultivator, I can't do that. You'll have to ask my husband once we'll reach the capital. A few minutes in the company of two high-level cultivators had already changed Daniel's perspective drastically. With the new information he had, he couldn't wait to comprehend time essence and learn all its practical uses. Daniel gave the woman a polite bow before leaving the room and walking towards his assigned one. Once inside, he put the small box that contained the gravitational room on the floor, and entered it. The very next moment, Daniel found himself surrounded by nothing. There were no walls made of spatial essence, only a small floor that extended a meter in radius from Daniel's position. Past that single meter, the spatial essence dissipated into nothingness. When Daniel observed the oddity of the gravitational room, the gravity within was still at a normal level. Unfortunately, it didn't take more than a few moments before the gravity increased to a hundredfold, and for Daniel to find himself on his knees. Before he could even try to force his lungs to inflate, the gravity changed again. The single feeble push caused by inhaling made him float helplessly in mid-air. Gravity kept changing over and over again, not giving Daniel any time to rest. It didn't take long before he fell unconscious, only to wake up after an unspecified amount of hours. When he woke up, he was still being buffeted up and down, so, before losing his consciousness once again, he activated, time is precious and started to comprehend how gravity worked. No time had passed within the gravitational field, and yet Daniel had only grown older by a week. His comprehension of the gravitational aspects of space was nearing perfection, and Daniel could feel that only being killed by gravity would help him make that last step towards perfection. But despite what he had told to Edmund, he decided not to attempt this method within a space with no time. After all, his comprehension of time was non-existent, and he wasn't sure if time could be reverted if there was none to begin with. Daniel's current comprehension of space had reached only 40%. But despite what one may think, 40% of spatial essence comprehension was beyond what a 16-year-old kid should possess. Regardless, Daniel had comprehended the change and effects of gravity. He wasn't in a hurry to learn the effects that too much gravity would have on a human's body. He left the gravitational box he was currently in, and appeared back inside his room. When he was about to open the door and leave, he heard knocking on the door. Behind it was Edmund's wife Emily. She looked at Daniel's sorry state, and with a gentle smile she said, You better clean up, we have arrived to the capital, then left quietly. Daniel quickly took his clothes off, washed his body with water essence, and put on a set of clean clothes, then he left Edmund's pocket dimension. When Daniel reappeared, he found himself in front of the most dazzling spectacle of his life. The capital of the Crehan Empire was called Crea and it was built above dozens of gigantic floating islands. Each island was connected to another by large and solid bridges. Enormous chains kept the floating islands anchored on the ground, and from drifting away. Dot in the air, Daniel could see thousands of floating people, and a few amongst them even rode high-ranking beasts. Of course, Daniel was aware of the power those beasts possessed. These beasts' intelligence was in no way inferior to that of an adult human, and some of them could even talk or shape-shift into human form. Shape-shifting was a specific kind of magic that beasts practiced once they reached a certain level of cultivation. What was interesting about it, was that the members of the beast species did not shape-shift into human form. Instead, they shape-shifted into their pure beastly form. Daniel had learned this from one of the books he had found within the castle. The higher a beast's cultivation reached, the more they would look like humans. Also, after reaching the seventh rank, they would learn how to change the composition of their body, 
and transform back into beasts. Daniel had seen an example of this with the commander Steel. Back Scorpion, which after reaching the fourth rank of cultivation, had obtained a faint humanoid body. Three sets of its walking legs had disappeared, while the remaining pair had turned into human dot like legs. Its pinchers had turned into arms, and its human dot like head was connected to the rest of his body by a neck. Considering how human dot like that beast had become after only reaching the fourth rank of cultivation, it was no wonder that an eight or ninth ranked beast would become almost indistinguishable from a member of the human race. This was not only something that regarded beasts. Even the Asims, and other races that Daniel hadn't met yet became more similar to humans the more powerful they became. This is Kriya. Asked Daniel with a face filled with surprise. Home to the biggest academies, mercenary groups, and Crehan's imperial family. Responded Edmund with a matter dot of dot fact tone. Let's go, we are already late for the first encounter. Before Daniel could even ask about this first encounter, Edmund teleported him into an extremely large square. In this square, the most powerful people within the Crehan Empire were standing along with their disciples. At the sides of the square were two long balconies, inside which two sets of chairs had been placed. These sets of chairs were divided into private boxes. Right in front of him, Daniel could see a large floating platform, on which seven chairs had been placed in an ordered line. The chairs in the middle was in a slightly higher position than the ones to its sides. These chairs were completely occupied by just as many people. These people were all extremely well dressed, and had a noble attitude. They quietly looked at the scene in the square in silence. Sitting at the edges of this line of chairs were the two youngest amongst them. A kid that didn't seem to have reached 12 years of age, and a teenage girl that seemed to be about Daniel's age. Closer to the center, were another young woman that showed the vitality of a twenty-year-old woman, and a stern young man that seemed to be in his early twenties as well. Sitting on the two chair placed at the direct sides of the middle one, were a middle-aged woman with a proud expression, and a carefree young man that seemed to be in his mid-twenties. Finally, sitting on the slightly elevated chair in the center of the platform, was a middle-aged man. This man had a stern look on his face, and seemed to have never heard a joke in his life. His golden armor, noble features, and overall appearance seemed to have been designed to remind others of this man's superiority. These people were the imperial family of the Crehan Empire, and the man in the middle, was the emperor. After looking around for just a minute, Daniel felt shocked once again. He had never seen so many young and powerful people. Usually he would be able to see people in their twenties with a cultivation rank between the fourth and fifth sage. But the average here was on another level. Everyone was at his and Jariah's level of cultivation level at the very least. Edmund noticed Daniel's shock and said, makes you think, doesn't it? I was never the arrogant type. I expected people at my level to exist. I just didn't think I would be able to see so many and so soon. Responded Daniel with a slightly irritated tone. Relax. These people aren't as talented as you are. They have used other methods to reach these levels. Said Edmund with a slight smile on his face. He was clearly enjoying the broadening of this absolute prodigy's horizon. With narrowed eyes and furrowed brows, Daniel looked at Edmund and asked what kind of methods. Time accelerated training grounds. Responded Edmund with a flat and uninterested tone. Once again, Daniel started to feel his body shiver in excitement with the idea of learning time essence. He looked at Edmund with vivid eyes and said, so that's one use of time essence. How does it work? Time essence affects other essences, but not the natural consumption of life essence, or how you'd call it, aging. Speeding time in a pocket dimension would allow one to absorb and consume essences at a faster rate, but without aging faster. Responded Edmund with a patient tone. Shock was clearly visible on Daniel's face. It didn't matter how many people in history would eventually learn about this, there would never be someone as surprised as Daniel was right now. The description of a pocket dimension with speeded time seemed to be a description of his very own karmic system. 
While still in the midst of his surprise, Daniel couldn't help but ask a question that popped into his mind. So, can I expect other participants to have an incredible comprehension of essences or perfect masteries of weapons? Why do you ask that? Asked Edmund with a slightly confused face. Daniel could already guess the answer by looking at Edmund's reaction, so he said, well, I assume that they are all rich beyond measure. They must have exploited all possibilities to reach the most power in the least amount of time. Am I wrong? You are not wrong. All of these disciples were able to cultivate in pocket dimensions with hasten time. That gave them much more time to practice the use of weapons, comprehend essences, and learn martial and spiritual arts. It is better if you don't underestimate them. Responded Edmund with a dead serious tone. He then continued, the first day of the event is the presentation. The disciples will go up on the stage one by one, and present themselves in front of the experts. How many events are there? Asked Daniel curiously. Five events. Presenting, demonstration, competition, evaluation, and gathering. Responded Edmund while looking around. He then said each event is two days apart from the other, so worry about your presentation. Daniel had finally started to feel a little pressure from the whole event. He then said, what am I supposed to say? Your name, age, path of cultivation. Your origins. Just observe what others do. It's unlikely that you'll be the first one. Responded Edmund with a casual tone. He then said, it's about to begin. Suddenly, every single master within the square disappeared, and when they reappeared, they were occupying the boxes within the two balconies. At the same time, in the square, a small stage appeared. It was a simple stage made out of stone, and all of them looked at it in silence. Daniel had no idea of what to do. So he stood back and observed. The various disciples looked at each other for a moment, before dashing at the stage without a second thought. The first to put his foot on the stony surface was a young man in blue robes, which had used water essence to propel himself himself with a water jet. The robe was extremely simple, but was tight enough to show his athletic body. His hair were of a lucid black color, which under the sunlight formed a dark blue reflection. The rest of the cultivators were rejected by the stage the very moment the foot of the first young man had touched the stony flooring. The young man approached the middle of the stage, turned to look at the imperial family, and after a deep bow, he said, this loyal servant's name is Midio. Chapter 89 The Gathering of Experts Part 2 You are listening at NovelFull.audio This loyal servant's name is Midio. I am a disciple of the Mistress of Ice, and part of her sect, the Crystal Clear Sect. 20.1 years of age. Faint spiritual merging stage. Said the young man with humbleness. He then turned to look at the rest of the disciples, and said, I claim the title of expert of water for my master. Anyone who disagrees, is welcome to challenge me during the competition event. There was a clear and direct meaning in the young man's words which escaped Daniel's understanding. During a gathering of experts, there would be various titles that would grant a master the right of joining the discussion during the gathering stage. In order to avoid confusion, the organizers of the first gathering of experts had decided that, every disciple would be able to claim a title for their master. If one disciple managed to defeat each and every other disciples that wanted to claim that same title, the title would belong to his master. By claiming the title of expert of water, the young man had claimed his master's superiority over any other spiritual cultivator that practiced water essence. Other disciples that claimed the same title would end up fighting during the competition stage. Winning meant one's master's superiority in teaching and knowledge, and that only he or she amongst all others had the right to talk. After he claimed the, the title of expert of water, the young man in blue robes called Midio went down the stage. The moment his feet left the stage's floor, another person immediately went up the stage. This time, it was a younger man. This young man was clad in shiny platinum armor with no helmet. In his hand he was holding a heavy double dot headed axe. This loyal servant's name is Ryer from the Pantheon of War Gods. 
My master is the axe wielder, and one of the school's elders. I was born nineteen years ago in the great Crehan Empire, and I stand here before you at the peak of the nigh inhuman stage, to claim the title of guardian of the axe for my master. He said before going down the stage. Point 18. Atsia. Melting Point Sect. Guardian of Fire. Azeos. Architects of Space. The title of Ruler of Space. Peak Sixth Rank. Dion. Archers of Doom. Guardian of Bow and Arrow. Ineas, for the Time Weavers. Perfection of the Spiritual Synchronization Stage. Ruler of Time. One after another, the disciples within the square went up on the stage and presented themselves to the imperial family. Amongst them, was someone that Daniel had recognized. The young lady of the Saulette family, Elysia. This loyal servant's name is Elysia. Daughter of the Mirror Shifter and the Scarlet Blade, of the Saulette family. I am a native of the Crehan Empire, and after sixteen years of age, I have reached the mid-surrounding awareness stage. For my mother and master, I claim the title of the ruler of the sword. She said after a deep and polite bow directed at the imperial family. She then stepped down the stage like everyone else before her. From the different types of titles, Daniel had more or less guessed that there were two types of titles. One was guardian, while the other was ruler. Only extremely difficult essences like time and space deserved the title of rule, along with the most versatile weapons like the sword and the spear. The rest, were considered more common and inferior weapons. Hence the titles Guardian of Fire, or Guardian of the Axe. After more than an hour, Daniel had been the only one left in the square. People amongst the crowd were already thinking that Daniel was simply the weakest, and that he had no way of reaching the stage before the other disciples could. Dot poor kid, the others probably scared him out of his wits. Must be his first time. It is worth mentioning that the order of presentation did not affect a disciple's evaluation. What it affected was a disciple's morale. By going first, one was able to claim a title first, and make use of the moment of attention to intimidate his opponents. Of course, Daniel wasn't aware of this, nor did he care. When he noticed that he was the only person left in the square, he teleported on the stage, shutting everyone's mouth. He bowed very slightly towards the imperial family, clearly differently than the rest of the cultivators. Then, he said, Dan, fifteen years old. I claim the title of ruler of space for the mirror shifter. He then tried to teleport out of the stage, but before he could manage to, the space around him was blocked. One of the masters within the balcony said, it is custom that disciples bow to the imperial family before leaving the stage. His voice deep and menacing. Daniel turned to look at the master, and said, I am not a native of the Crehan Empire. I have respect for the imperial family, but I have other rulers to bow down to before them. How dare you? Said the man in the balconies before waving his hand. But just as he waved his hand, Daniel felt the space around him being unlocked. Then, another voice resounded in his ears. It was never a problem for participants of other nations to only recognize the imperial family and not bow to them. Do I take it that this time it's different because you will have to fight your own disciple for the title? Asked Edmund from the balconies opposite to the one where the other man was staying. Of course not. I just got irritated by his tone. Proceed with the ceremony, said the man who had attempted to attack Daniel. Edmund's protection made Daniel reconsider his character. Of course, he might have done this only out of rivalry with another master of space essence, but he had also supported someone who had seemingly behaved in a rude manner towards the imperial family. And that was a big risk in Daniel's book. Suddenly, the three oldest children of the imperial family stood up and jumped on the square. Then, in order by seniority, they went up the stage and presented themselves. Krissa, first princess of the Crehan Empire. I claim the title of ruler of space for my master, the master of invisible walls. Said the twenty years old young woman. 
After she left the stage, the second oldest one amongst the siblings present jumped over the stage and said, Krim, third prince of the Crehan Empire. I claim the title of ruler of the spear for my master, the Phantom Piercer. The third and last to go up the stage, was the oldest and most carefree amongst them. My name is Kriam, and I am the second prince of the Crehan Empire. I claim the title of ruler of sound for my master and mother, the Empress. After the quick introduction, the three left the stage and went back to sit on their chairs above the floating pedestal. The stage disappeared from the center of the square, and a man appeared in its place. This man was completely covered by a black coat, so none of his features could be seen. He said in a loud and powerful voice. The presentation stage of the gathering has terminated. The demonstration stage will take place two days from now. After the announcement, the platform on which the imperial family was sitting on disappeared. Only then did the powerful cultivators dare to recover their disciples and leave the square. You probably should have been a little more polite, said Emily while looking at Daniel. Edmund interjected in the conversation and said to his wife, It's all right. The emperor said nothing, and now he has been noticed. He then turned to look at Daniel and said, You have two days before the demonstration. Are you ready? It wouldn't hurt to know what am I supposed to demonstrate it, responded Daniel with an irritated tone. Edmund had forgotten to explain many things to him about the whole event. Just demonstrate your comprehension of essence. That will be enough. He responded in a casual manner. Speaking of essence. What else do you have to teach me about spatial essence? Asked Daniel with hints of curiosity and expectation. Edmund entered a pensive state for a few moments, then looked back at him and said two words, fictitious space. Daniel couldn't help but smile before saying, can I make a request? Go on. Responded Edmund plainly. Daniel's smile widened as he said, I would like to borrow the time sphere you own that speeds time the most. Daniel's surroundings looked normal, and had he not known that he was currently within fictitious space, he would have fallen for this illusion. He was currently standing in the square where he had presented himself, with nothing else but a gray sphere which emanated a faint feeling of antiquity. Nobody else was around, only him. Without thinking it over for too long, Daniel installed the time sphere within the pocket dimension that contained the fictitious space. He could not feel the change directly, so he sat right next to the sphere, and activated, time is precious. It didn't take long for Daniel to notice something that confirmed his guesses. The time sphere could hasten his speed his progress just like the karmic system could. He then thought that the most plausible reason why nobody had managed to use time essence to hasten comprehension, must have had something to do with the mind. The only guess that Daniel was able to make, was that there was an unknown type of essence that regarded the mind, which he unknowingly happened to understand thanks to the karmic system. If Daniel was right, that would mean that the karmic system acted over the wielder's mind, time and life. What was even better than the discovery of being able to cultivate with time essence, was that time essence and the karmic system's effect could add up to each other. After a minute of attempts, he found out that despite the order he activated the effects, their added effect would always be the same. Daniel's current level of time is precious granted him roughly 500 times the speed of cultivation a normal person had, in exchange of karma points, while the time sphere multiplied the speed of progression by three times. This meant that, thanks to both time sphere and karmic system, he would be able to achieve what one took three years to do in one day. And cream on top, the karmic system only counted its own increase in progression when consuming the point. No matter if the time sphere was activated or not, he would only spend the normal amount of points he would normally spend with, time is precious activated. Daniel decided to waste no more time, and immediately started to comprehend not only the fictitious space, but also the acceleration of time contained within the time sphere. Twelve hours later. After only twelve hours of looking at the time flow at a faster pace, and feeling the difference between fictitious space and real space with his spiritual essence, Daniel had finally managed to understand these two very different portions of essence. He was now looking at the time sphere. 
in pain at the sheer thought that he would have to give it back to Edmund when they would part ways. Of course, now he could speed time by threefolds by himself, but he wouldn't be able to create a time sphere without a time treasure. Unfortunately, Daniel hadn't even heard of a time treasure being sold, not to talk about its price. The gathering of experts was composed of five events distributed in the span of eight days. So, he decided to make full use of these eight days and learn as much as he could from Edmund. A sudden flash of determination made its appearance on Daniel's face, and the very next moment, two rank seven beast cores appeared in his hands.